welcome to the Google Chrome Developers uh, uh, WebGL Hangout. And today we've got a bunch of people from the WebGL uh, community. They are participating. Um, a bunch of people from the 3 side. And uh, we've got Brendan Kenny, who's from the Google Maps GL team, and uh, Brandon Jones from the, um, well, he's done some cool demos. Uh, Todicode.com. So, if you guys would like to um, give us a nice small self introduction first, um, I'll start. Okay, so I'm Ilmar Heikinen and I work on the Google Chrome Developer Relations team here at, uh, in London. And basically, I do demos, articles, talks, stuff. Um, and run Hangouts like this. So, please. Okay, let's start. I'll go next. Um, I'm Paul Lewis. Um, some people know me from Aratwist.com. I spend most of my days uh, as a web developer. Um, but outside of that, um, I do WebGL demos and kind of make myself useful in that way, uh, writing tutorials and that kind of thing. Okay, so I go next. Hello, Ricardo. And uh, so um, I'm doing some tutorial on learning3js.com and uh, some nice demo on shortly I'm writing tQuery. Right, so that person was Jérôme Etienne. <laughs> um, I think he missed Sorry, that. yes. Yeah. Thanks for <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you'll move Can't hear you. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm I'm Brendan Kenny. I, I as Amari said, I work on the uh, the Maps Developer Relations team at at Google. So like him, I write uh, demos and and code samples and uh, help developers make good maps. And we're kind of gearing up right now, actually, with some really exciting uh, WebGL data visualization stuff that that we started talking about last week at Strata and this week at South by Southwest in a couple of weeks. Um, so, which is which is great because WebGL is very close to my heart, and any excuse I have to to make it as much of my job as possible is is very welcome. Right, um, I'm Brandon Jones, and I'm HTML5 developer for Motorola. Uh, WebGL hobbyist. It doesn't actually have too much to do with my real job, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I I just like to put several demos online. Um, author of the GL Matrix library, and yeah, just generally enjoy working with and promoting WebGL wherever I can. Thank you. Um, and we had Ricardo join us as well. Uh, <coughs> Hello. Can you give us a short introduction? Sure. Uh, so, I'm, can you hear me? Yes. No? Cool. Uh, so, I'm Ricardo Capello, or Capello and um, I started a library for having for doing 3D uh, in JavaScript uh, about two years ago. Originally it was for Canvas, and now we have a WebGL render, and we have some samples with that. And yeah, I mainly work and, uh, uh, on that library nowadays. And I don't I think I've heard of it. Yeah, complete no. mystery. To <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I keep trying, you know, trying to do yeah. that so you can see it. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So that is Ricardo Cabello or Mr. Du from the 3JS fame. Oh, I didn't uh, mention the, the name. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, <coughs> just you get an idea how how good I am at those things. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So the agenda agenda today is uh, well, we've got a lot of 3JS people here, so. Let's talk about 3JS, let's talk about WebGL, what works, what doesn't, how to get started, that kind of a thing. Um, if you're working on anything cool that you can share, um, might be fun to hear about it. Um, so thank you all for joining us. This is great. Is there a way to know how many people are Watching this? <laughs> I have no idea. 
I don't okay. think so. We can see them. We can see recorded views on YouTube. So. Hey guys, um, I'm Pete. I'm one of the developer advocates working on the, the Chrome team with Elmari and, and a bunch of these other guys. Um, let me actually ask a, a first question from uh, one of the things that I've seen a bunch of people ask. What's the best way for folks to get started with the 3JS libraries? Um, I think I think Jerome can do it. <laughs> can answer that. <laughs> well, the, okay, so, come on. <laughs> okay, so there's a bunch of tutorial on the um, available on the network. There's I wrote I wrote with, sorry I'm bad with name. So Paul Lewis wrote wrote one which is uh, a <laughs> guy pretty active, and um, it's called. Uh, Get started. I remember if I remember. Yeah, getting well. getting started with 3JS, definitely. Yeah, that's what it's called. So it sort of does what it says on the tin. That one, really. Yeah, <laughs> it's on the README, and I think you are on HTML5 rocks too. And um, personally, I do learning 3JS blog, which is a bunch of tutorial on that. If you want to learn learning 3JS, there is obviously reading the tutorial is a good part of it. After that, you can. <coughs> Come and join the IRC channel to get some help, live help. You can ask on GitHub, or in fact, the meat of 3GS is inside the example. There's something like Ricardo, maybe correct, correct me, but a huge, huge bunch of them, something like 130 or something like that. 1,000. 1,000. <laughs> I hope not for you, but. I hope <laughs> <that>. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I'm gonna tell you about a good bunch of them, showing the various possibility. You read the code, and after that, you you get how it works. It's not that hard, seriously. It's uh, pretty easy, I believe at least. Yeah, mainly, mainly uh, I, I think I think it's always the best way just to try with. Uh, Play with examples and choose some values, and so you start to get an idea how more or less how the API works. And these days, I'm working on the documentation finally, mm. uh, so that will hopefully, you know, make things easier for people that don't think like me. <laughs> it, um, if I could just add something to that, um, I think at the last WebGL camp that we did um, at Mozilla, uh, Henrik mentioned that. Um, you know, anything that we're doing with WebGL is effectively open source by default because you can go to any of the sample pages and, you know, hit um, control U, whatever it is in your browser of choice, and pull up the source right there. And I, I think I've yet to see a 3JS uh, tutorial or demo that was actually obfuscated in any way. So if you see something that you like online, pull up the source and start looking through it. I, I've found that that's in many cases, the best way to learn once you've gotten over that initial, um, you know, getting started period. Yep. Um, I also have some like, uh, basics of 3 ds uh, slide deck up with a bunch of examples, so that might be a one way to get started as well, if you just want to. Where can folks find those? Sorry? Where can people find those if they want to look for them? Uh, OK, so the 3JS homepage, actually, the 3JS wiki has uh, links for getting started. I think it's uh, github.com slash mrdoob slash 3.js. And click on the wiki link there. And your slides? Uh, my slides would be at fhtr.org slash uh, basics of 3JS with strange camel capital. <laughs> All right. So URL. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds like a great URL. What we'll do is yeah. we'll add the, <laughs> the uh, links that get mentioned in the video as well as in the comments for the video afterwards. So if you miss any of these links, don't worry about that too much. Okay, great. If, if we put something into the group chat, will it show up for anybody who's viewing the broadcast? No, sadly it won't. I, I, I wonder if it's, uh, if it's better use for people that want to start to go to 
uh, learning WebGL just so they see what the, you know the complexity of the things are before you know going to a framework or a library. I don't know if which what's better if it's better to do, go to you know library first and then understand what's going on under or I don't know. I mean that that's kind of how I started. I started out with three JS and then and as I got kind of comfortable with that, I then kind of hit a, a, a slight frustration wall where I was like, okay, but how is this actually doing all this magic on screen? So for me, I, I mean, not necessarily the same for everybody, but I think my experience was definitely that if I if I went straight to the WebGL, I found it overwhelming, I think, having a, having it abstracted away so I could learn the basic concepts was helpful first, like mm -hmm. what's geometry, all those things. And then after that, I started to, to try and understand what was going on underneath it. So... But I can see the other way around as well, and I think a lot of people would say it would say it works for them the other way around. But certainly in my case, I found it easier to start with the library first and then understand what it was doing once I understood those basics. Mm -hmm. yeah, Did anybody I, else go the other way around? I, I, I went the other way around, but I think um, I was a bit of a special case in that I'd been working with um, 3D APIs, Direct 3D, and, and OpenGL on the desktop for a while um, just as a hobby. And so jumping into WebGL initially was a fairly natural transition because it really is just OpenGL ES2 on the web. And so if you've got that kind of background, um, you know, it's probably going to be more natural and easier just to jump into using the, the API directly. But if you're not familiar with that, um, I, I mean, it's an API that's evolved over a a good long time and it's fairly complex, there's a lot of moving parts and it takes a lot of boilerplate code just to get that initial polygon on screen during which you're pulling your hair out going, why can't I see anything? As such, um, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm always in favor of, um, you know, people learning what's going on behind the scenes, but I really do think for something like this, starting out with a framework is maybe the path of least frustration. Uh, that said, I do wish that there was a little bit more in the way of, of like a bridge between your three JSs and you know the the raw WebGL to say, all right, well, you know, if if you're doing this in the framework, here's how you transition into uh, you know the real world when when you want to do something that's not nicely encapsulated by a library because everybody's going to hit that at some point. Yeah, but it's always yeah. part of the point, I think. Uh, my opinion, at least, is one big advantage of 3GS of the base is you don't need to understand all the mathematics behind. Yeah, which, mathematics. which is a huge plus at the very beginning when you're starting to learn. Exactly. Because that's very complicated stuff. So, and people like it because they find matrices, they find stuff like that, and they don't want to do that. So, that, at least in my personal opinion, one big advantage of libraries because they hide all these problems. I, I completely agree. I think. Well, I, I, I think um, that's a, it's a really good point. But I think. I mean, Brandon. I think you touched on this a while ago in one of your blog posts about uh, one of the reasons that you you do the raw WebGL is as much as anything. Sometimes you can really target exactly what you want to do, and you know the best one in the world. Any engine is is trying to give you a fairly generic view and, and let you do a number of tasks and you might need to just go straight in and do one specific thing and in that case uh, it might not be as suitable to use a library, it might actually be uh, more suitable to just try and pinpoint that one little thing that you're trying to do. What yeah. is the tutorial coverage like? Um, since I see a bunch of tutorials that are, well, um, on one hand there's uh, 3JS, getting started with 3JS, getting started with libraries, and then there's this uh, sort of low-level uh, WebGL, uh, you know, the very basics and getting up from there. So I guess the bridge would be something that's sort of like making your own uh, 3D library or something like that. I would have a really hard time recommending that to anybody, um, <laughs> honestly. I mean, well done, can do it. <laughs> I, I, it, I, it would cer certainly be a, a educational experience for people, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. But doing well, it depends on, I mean, are you trying to get something done, or are you just trying to, to make something and learn? I mean, I, I think Paul would be the best person to ask about 
how effective that is at, at learning. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, in case anybody doesn't know, well, after I, so my, my way of learning um, WebGL after spending some time with 3JS was to, to try and write my own. And uh, Brendan was actually ex exceedingly helpful during that process as I was sort of scratching my, my head and pulling my hair up um, for sort of how do you use matrices, you know, all those kinds of things that were, had been abstracted away and I, I couldn't remember from my time at school. Um, as, would I use my own engine in production? I'd be hand on the heart say no, I'd use 3JS if I, if I was in a production setting because I think it's a lot more mature as a library. In terms of learning, I learned tons doing it. I learned what not to do. I've, there are still tons of things that I'm still learning that I should have done better. But I think in terms of starting from absolutely no understanding to understanding, okay, these are the components, these are the bits that go in, yeah, I'm glad I wrote, tried to write one, certainly. Um, so it, it, it's valid from a learning standpoint for sure. But as Brendan said, if you're trying to get something done, you might want to use something that's already mature and out there and working. Yeah, it won't be a, it won't be an efficient process. You'll be spending a lot of time wondering why nothing's on the screen. So actually, yeah. there's a question in the moderator right now that I think uh, this segues really nicely into. But the question is, um, what are some of the most popular and uh, efficient tools? Uh, and libraries for people to, to use with WebGL? <laughs> well, d define efficiency. I mean, are you talking about efficiency <laughs> rendering? Are you talking about efficiency of how fast it is to get something up on screen? Um, you know, there, there are well, several different ways you could take that. Yeah, absolutely. I'll leave that up to your imagination as the uh, <laughs> questioner did for us. So however you want to answer that. <laughs> Go ahead, guys. <laughs> Isn't that like a wiki page with all the list of um, WebGL on Kronos? I think it's on Kronos website. There is a list of all the frameworks and libraries that for people to play with. Uh, yeah. I it's think GLD, it has something similar too. What Thank if you. we, maybe we can decompose that and see, for example, if efficiency is uh, development time, if efficiency is running speed, um, I don't know, we, we can list various options. For I, haven't, I haven't used, uh, you know, all of the, the WebGL frameworks, so I haven't used, say, uh, like CNJS or, or things like that, but... Um, I'm a big fan of, I know Brendan was talking earlier about the transition between uh, um, transition between 3JS and then kind of more pure WebGL. I'm a big fan of PhiloGL or PhiloGL, depending on how you uh, pronounce your, your Greek letters. And, uh, and also, this one doesn't get talked about much, but Evan Wallace uh, has made some really amazing WebGL demos with kind of, uh, he's the guy with, that made the ball that's floating in water and it does real time uh, refraction and everything, path tracing. Anyway, he has a really lightweight WebGL uh, library on his GitHub account, on his GitHub page. And, uh, and I don't know if he ever advertises it, but you can go and fork it and, and use it. Um, so I'm a big fan of those, but only if you want to get like pretty as close to WebGL as possible with, with, with taking like some of the... Uh, some of the boilerplate out of the mix. Have you tried the TDL one from Greg Tavares? Yes, that's yeah, oh, that's a good point. That's a, that's another one. I haven't used that in in a while though. I don't know if he. But do you know how how he compares to the um, Evan one? Oh, uh, it's pretty similar. I mean, Greg is a is like a graphics programmer, like long time yeah. graphics programmer. So it's definitely. Uh, and he, you know, he comes from like a C C plus plus background, and I think that's when. He was writing it while he was still kind of getting to know JavaScript, so it's not as naturally JavaScript, but mm -hmm. it's definitely, in terms of efficiency, it's definitely there because that's, I mean, that's why he wrote it was to get things on the screen with with no, you know, craft in between. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, definitely um, a fan of of picking, you know, code from Greg's uh, code at, at any time. I want to just get something done. Um, Uh, Brandon, do you have a? You've done this uh, like the Quake three demo and the and the TF two demo and the Rage demo, and they all seem to be something that would actually use quite a bit of horsepower. 
and require a lot of performance. So do you have any tips and tricks on that? Oh, goodness. Um, I, I'm very fond of saying that anything that you would have done in the desktop um, it still applies here for the most part, but I'm learning more and more that, um, and I think this is great, by the way, that we've got a large um, community of people who are coming into WebGL as experienced web developers, but not necessarily experienced 3D developers from the desktop. So I think that that, um, that advice maybe falls a little flat. Um, but what was well, so some of the just really general tips, and I've seen that many of the frameworks allow these um, allow these optimizations in some way, shape, or form, um, is primarily you just want to group um, as many similar draw calls together as you can. Um, so if you've got a whole bunch of geometry that uses the same texture, the same material, whatever the case may be, um, you want to try to, as much as possible, render those in a single draw call. Um, I know, for example, like uh, 3JS, and I, I don't know the the right terminology for this, maybe Ricardo can help me out, um, allows you to actually batch up geometry into a single buffer. And um, you know, like merging, merging geometry into a single geometry, yeah. Yeah, thank you, that's, that's what yeah. it is. Um, you want to try to do that, that kind of thing as much as possible. Um, so just as, as a high level bit of, of um, real world advice, so for the Quake 3 and the, the TF2 demos, um, what I tend to do is do a pre-process over the, the level, just sort everything by um, material, and then um, if I'm doing any visibility culling, it tends to be on the material level, not the geometry block level. And uh, my render loop is basically just a loop over every material in the scene, and then I render every triangle that uses that material um, to switch state as little as possible. And this tends to be a very effective way of rendering a lot of polygons very quickly. Um, but it does take a lot of, of pre-sorting and pre-calculating to, to begin with. So it's, it's not necessarily an easy process, but it's a worthwhile one if you're really going for high performance. Thanks. That's awesome. Um, OK, so I'm going to go through my spiel a bit. Um, so this is the Google Chrome developers uh, WebGL Hangouts. And here we have a list of guests from the WebGL world, uh, starting from the left, uh, Brandon Jones from uh, Togicode.com. Uh, then we have Brendan Kenny uh, from the Google Maps developer relations team. Um, me, Ilmar Heikinen, from the Google Chrome developer relations team. Then we've got uh, Jerome Etienne from learning3js.com, uh, uh, Paul Lewis um, from aerotwist.com, uh, and Ricardo Cabello of 3JS fame. Okay, and we are talking about WebGL and 3JS. <laughs> uh, Michael, uh, greetings. We have a new guest. Uh, any questions thus far? I think he's mute. Oh. Come on. Oh. Now? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Wow. Hi. No, I, I, I just I just joined. Uh, I I just uh, wanna wanna agree on what Brandon just said that keeping draw calls down is a big one. Uh, I'm sitting with a WebGL project right now, uh, prototyping, and we we saw some great uh, uh, performance increase when we uh, did just that. That when we just brought down like 2,000 draw calls into one, and it was a, this huge performance uh, increase, which was great. So, so I actually have. Cool, thanks. I have a question for Brendan. Uh, Brendan, I know that uh, the Maps team is doing some stuff around uh, WebGL. Can you talk about that just a little bit? Oh, uh, yeah. So we're, we've been kind of on a kick uh, lately that um, to uh, get, um, let's see, 
thinking about how to visualize large data sets, uh, as especially geographic data sets, but in our case, just large data sets, um, kind of looking at, at beyond kind of 3D uh, or, I guess, games uh, applications of, of WebGL. You know, I love, I'm a gamer at heart, but, um, but it's interesting to look at kind of what WebGL, uh, what experiences WebGL enables that, that didn't exist before or even kind of a year ago. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we, we've been looking at kind of uh, what, what can we do to kind of look, at, take a glimpse into, into large data sets and see the kind of patterns um, that are there. Um, and we have a presentation, but I don't know how to, like, link it up. But uh, we've been, we've been uh, starting to present some things with uh, uh, my colleague, Chris Broadfoot, um, just presented a, a really great data set. It's uh, like a million GPS coordinates from cabs in San Francisco from one, from one night in San Francisco. And, uh, and so he visualized it in real time. You can kind of see uh, kind of where all the cabs are, but then you can kind of also spread it out through time so you can start seeing like where are the slow parts in the city, um, where are cabs just kind of like hanging out during the night, or even like we started looking at some really cool stuff of, of kind of the spread of the GPS points because you can see in, in downtown San Francisco there's not good uh, GPS reception because of the tall buildings. And so you see the, the GPS becomes kind of a fog instead of nice paths on the, on the road. So you, once you can actually see it on screen, you can start getting ideas for uh, kind of teasing out patterns and data that you, that you wouldn't actually be able to do if you just saw it kind of in a CSV file. Um, so... Anyway, so yeah, we've been working on kind of um, good ways of doing that and then starting to, to advocate to developers uh, j just now. We're going to continue. At, there's a South by Southwest session sometime very soon. I'm not sure. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what we're up to. Isn't it next, next week, South by Southwest? It could be. I don't know. <laughs> I think it starts this weekend. I think, yeah, the interactive starts this weekend. Yeah. And then maybe music right. is next week or something. Um, I see. So there's another question from the moderator that I want to just pop up. Uh, and the question was, do you think that, uh, and it's okay not to know the answer to this, but do you think that Dart will have some WebGL functions directly included in it? Um, so... I was actually playing around with WebGL in Dart maybe a week ago, um, just doing some initial pokings at that. It is supported right now. Um, it, it, you access it through their DOM API. So it's, I mean, it's very much just a direct exposure of the underlying WebGL API. There's not anything really too terribly special about it to, to help you out, at least not yet. I don't know what their plans are for it going in the future. Um, and I do. I, I must say that it's a little annoying to work with because any of your enumerations, you end up having to type out the full WebGL object name every time. It's like WebGL render context dot blend, <laughs> um, which is which is a little annoying. But it works. It works quite well. I found it to be fairly performant. Um, and yeah, it's just it's it's very low level at this point. That's that's about the only thing I had to say against it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard with WebGL being so young to really commit to an abstraction that maybe Dart would like uh, and then know in, like, you know, a year or two that it would have been a good decision. So it seems like it's better to, to leave it at low level and then maybe rely on authors to make something like a, a 3GS in, in Dart. Um, it, theoretically, in time, it, it might be nice, the uh, kind of type checking and, and other kind of uh, benefits of Dart might be a good thing there. Um, on the other hand, like, uh, WebGL code is already very typed because you have to have, like, typed arrays and that sort of thing, so um, I don't, I don't, it seems like it, it would be a bit of a wash, you know, like, it, it's, it's very much there if you are using Dart, um, but I don't know if, if there are any great advantages that Dart brings there. Yeah, I, I didn't find it to be any better or worse, really. It's just, it's just WebGL. Cool. Well, there's another question in here. Um, with WebGL coming to mobile platforms, what kind of new applications will this enable, and will performance be good enough to compete with native applications? This is from Jeff. Well, um, WebGL performance is 
basically JavaScript performance uh, plus the uh, binding to the OpenGL ES 2.0 drivers performance. So uh, if the mobile JavaScript performance is there, then you should be able to do stuff that you can do in on mobile in native code uh, graphics-wise. Well, that's my hunch, at least. Yes. There was that Opera demo a week or so ago, right, that was running 60, 70 frames a second, um, mm -hmm. and it was, the, it was the, the, the Opera, the guy walking on the, the platform looking yeah. really mean and grumpy. You know the one? It yeah, yeah. Seven, 72 polygons, 72 FPS with 37,000 polygons, and it was on Opera Mobile, and um, but uh, well, this was a demo. The main difference that I have seen on a mobile is the stupid. Is first the GPU doesn't have the same characteristic. So what we are used to on uh, desktop, no more apply something. The bottleneck is almost, almost the same. And uh, another part which for three GS is important, the JavaScript is much lower. So all 3GS is going to have to make progress, let's say. That's my take. So just to, to throw this out, um, I actually had a coworker of mine um, show me uh, the, the new Opera 12 running on, I think it was an Atrix 2. Um, and we pulled up uh, my Quake 3 demo. And we were able to get it running on there at about 26 frames per second. Um, which was was pretty good overall there now um, as a as a disclaimer on that one um, I've got the quake 3 demo set so that when you run it on mobile now it will actually render at a quarter of the screen size and then upscale it through CSS so it's not it's not you know utilizing every pixel on the screen but generally it still gives acceptable results and I mean we're, we were getting pretty close to 30 frames per second on that device. I also tried it on I think an older model Samsung Galaxy Tab and unfortunately I was getting maybe 12 or so on that but it was also rendering a much larger screen area. Um, but I must say that overall I was actually very impressed at how well Opera was able to handle it. Um, I've, I've done some similar experiments in Firefox in the past. Uh, unfortunately, haven't done those recently, but it's always seemed to do decently. And I'm looking forward to when they finally flip the switch on WebGL for Chrome on mobile to see where that is too. But it's, it's definitely much lower than you would ever get on the desktop, but performs better than expected, I'd say. Yeah, you shouldn't you shouldn't feel bad about shrinking the back buffer because that's common on on native apps too. So they can't they can't complain. <laughs> yeah, I I uh, I'm really excited about the the mobile uh, WebGL stuff. I think not only does it let us make kind of uh, this new content, so that's uh, that's exciting in and of itself having it on mobile. But I think in terms of uh, the mobile platform itself, it'll it, it'll enable kind of uh, experiences that. We haven't been able to make before, and it will be in your in your pocket, just like a just like a native app. Um, you know, there are very different performance characteristics. You definitely have to think about the JavaScript ep execution and think about how much can you kind of pre-compute and pre-transform or, or pre-whatever um, on you know on the server side or beforehand, so that when it comes down to JavaScript, you're not spending a lot of time like decompressing a mesh or like you know doing some fancy thing. Uh, where it will take you know ten seconds and maybe it'll block the the main thread as it as it uploads to the to the GPU. Um, you know generally the the vertex shaders on on phones are, are less powerful, um, but they do have an advantage of a lot of them use this uh, kind of tile deferred rendering behind the scenes, um, which lets you save a lot on the fragment shaders. It it won't actually run the fragment shaders until the very end, so you don't get a lot of overdraws. So sometimes you can do fancier effects than than you think. Uh, which is nice. Um, so that's something else, but I can't remember now. There was something I was trying last week. Uh, I don't know if we can see it uh, with the Opera browser for mobile that they also allow um, access to the webcam. I don't know if this works at all. Uh, there you go. If you pull back it a little bit, can you see? Oh, this is my finger. 
Oh, sorry. Try it again. It's um, uh, an example from, I, I never know how to pronounce his, his name. I think it's Nif. Come, and he has this webcam toy that uh, basically with, the, with Opera you can access to the webcam from the website and then apply filters using WebGL and GLSL. So this guy has like a ton of effects and you can, it's like, you can start to, to get an idea that kind of, a, you know, a mental reality whenever it's something that actually makes sense to do with that that is actually useful. Uh, but now you have access from the browser to do, uh, to play with that. Uh, let's see if I can put it, make it work again. Ricardo, did you try uh, augmented reality on the phone? Uh, no, no, but um, I guess this is just, uh, I guess it's going to be quite a little bit slow to find uh, targets and everything. Uh, let's see if I can yeah. make it. Yeah, yeah. yeah part so of the problem is the frame rate on those cameras can be a little slow. And uh, and a lag as well, and so you know maybe if somebody's trying to find something, they've already pointed to the opposite the way by the time your your code gets to it. I remember the other thing I was going to say was just definitely check out uh, both Apple and uh, and Google have great resources on the on the Android and iOS development sites for uh, graphics in native mobile apps, and that definitely applies if you're if you're interested in getting into uh, mobile WebGL, it's the same exact thing, kind of the same performance characteristics, because obviously once you upload to the GPU, it's all the same, but looking at, you know, how you can make your data easy, uh, like faster to compute on, like what can you do in your shaders, that sort of thing, uh, to get to get better mobile code, because it is, it really is a, a pretty different architecture, uh, you know, underneath the API, yeah. uh, but definitely check those out if you're interested. I was seeing some people that were kind of expecting that, in instance for the 3.0 JS examples, they were expecting that the 3.0 JS examples were going to work on mobile, but I don't think that's really going to be the case. Like, if you if you want to support the mobile, you should start right from the mobile and then going up to the desktop, rather than having desktop and, like, you know, magically not working or working on the mobile or, or just playing in the library because it's too slow, you know. It just needs to be from the bottom to the slower to the fastest one. So there's a question uh, here from uh, Andrew in, in the UK. Many developers have now gained famili familiarity with 2D context of Canvas. What resources would you recommend uh, for transitioning to 3D with WebGL? From 2D Canvas, uh, WebGL is a whole different beast. Um, 2D Canvas is... Um, where you draw stuff, you draw paths, lines, text, images. In WebGL, you've got textures and buffers and uh, shaders that actually turn all that other things into an image on your screen. And that is a pretty big leap. Uh, but I would go with learningwebgl.com, which gives you a an understanding of the of the very basics and, and getting started with simple things. Uh, the other thing would be 3JS or another library that abstracts away all the, um, well, complicated things, or rather the things that you don't really actually want to do most of the time. So just, uh, I don't know if it directly maps to the question that he's asking, but there was an interesting uh, blog post by Greg um, Kat Tavares yep. um, that's it's, uh, it's uh, entitled WebGL Fundamentals, WebGL is a 2D API. And that's, a, that's an interesting read at the very least in that he just goes over, um, you know, basically how, how WebGL functionality um, maps to, you know, just 2D drawing it. And in the end, actually, it really truly is, um, you know, a 2D API. It's the matrices that make it 3D. Um, so if you're familiar with a lot of 2D concepts, that's probably a decent um, article to read through because it, it does hit on some of those concepts. Okay. Just, uh, I don't know if you can see, but OpenGL OS programming guide just like the reference to learn OpenGL and people may not know but WebGL is basically the exact same that this with JavaScript on the side. So if you want to understand 
actually WebGL, you read that and you make a lot of progress. That's my answer at least. These are the same for shaders. Are there actually any books available today specifically on WebGL or anything like that if somebody wants to get a book that anyone would recommend? Not yet. Um, one is coming, but not for a while. Later this year. So I think I think right now that really is the book, the book. So yeah. what what's the one that you're thinking of that's coming? Are you talking to me? Your book. <laughs> it might be I'm yours. I'm not. I'm not sure. That, that, that's what I'm wondering. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not writing a secret book. Cause I'm not saying that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We want There's to a go. book coming. Said yeah, said Brent. <laughs> that's not mine. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've been co-authoring a, a WebGL beginner's guide, but I, I really have no idea when it's going to be coming out. Um, I can say that the first drafts of all the chapters are done, but that doesn't mean too much in terms of publishing dates. Um, so you're going to finish it like next week is what you're saying? I'm yeah. committing right now on the air. Wow. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's a big commitment. Well done, yeah. Brandon. <laughs> and and it is recorded live on and will hey, be no 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 okay no redact yeah, everything that I just said <laughs> no, you committed you committed you no know, we know <laughs> anyway it will be nice to have a, a actually WebGL book because I know it is difficult talking to some people that um, have have opened up the OpenGL yes to programming guide you know it's it's like C code and like uh, you know. OpenGL is already rather esoteric due to its, its kind of legacy, 20-year-plus legacy. Um, so it will be nice to have a book that's, that's specifically about WebGL, so you're not simultaneously learning about OpenGL and trying to translate in your head the JavaScript calls. Um, but it, it, it maps fairly closely. So once you kind of, kind of are a little more used to WebGL, um, it's, it's definitely a very handy guide. I keep it next to my, like on my desk for, for reference. So. Okay. Is it um, better to learn on maybe about GLSL rather than WebGL? You know, like WebGL is kind of the connection between, say, JavaScript and the GLSL, you know, the shading language. And Polish, the shading language is something that you can use for doing much more different stuff than not like, you know, the, say, boring stuff that it's in the middle. Um, so they're like, I think they're like really good. I don't have the book in hand, but they're like really good examples, really good books about GLSL that you get an idea of how, you know, how the graphics cards works and what you send to the vertex shed and to the fragment shed and then you just start to understand more or less how the pieces fit together. Could you just define what GLSL is for maybe those of us who are uh, a little bit naive? Wow. Uh, anyone or, do that? or like the, the 10 <laughs> second <laughs> version <laughs> of it? Sure. Okay. GLSL is the Graphics library shading language. All right, so there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what does that stand for? Oh, okay. Now everything's clear, right? Yeah. As mud, absolutely. Okay. It's a uh, well, it's a it's a very small language um, that is is very domain specific to graphics, and it has some nice things that are built in, like uh, vectors or, or native types. Um, so that's easy to, to express kind of what's efficient on the graphics card in this language. And that's what you actually pass up uh, to the graphics card. It, it, you know, the driver compiles it to code uh, like in, in while your program is running, while your, app, your JavaScript app is running. Uh, and then that's what's run on the graphics card. So it can be very efficient, these, these little programs that run on the graphics card. So that's when you pass the data, that's the, these little programs run on that data and, and decide what shows up on the screen. Um, and the nice thing about it is that it's it's the same language as it's used kind of uh, pretty much for all of OpenGL, but definitely for OpenGL, yes. Um, so there's nothing, there's no translation to, to JavaScript or anything. It's, it's the exact same language. Um, and then it, it's also so small that you really can look. I just, I just have the spec. I don't even refer to anything else anymore because um, there's so few features that, that you can learn it all uh, and, and fit it in your head. Um, yeah, well, it's very easy to learn graphics. graphics. Go ahead, in my. Yeah, so GLSO, the one line Python description that I have is that it's like C for graphics. But it's not C for graphics like CG. It's no. <laughs> yeah. Other one. 
Well, see, just, no. Cool. I just want to make one quick comment. If you're watching this live right now and you have questions for any of these guys, make sure you post them to the moderator link, which is uh, listed there in the comments, so that we can get to your questions. I'll pass it back over to Elmari. Okay. So yes, welcome back. This is the Chrome Developer, uh, Google Chrome Developers um, WebGL Hangouts. And with me today, I have guests, uh, Brandon Jones from Togico.com, uh, Brandon Kenny from the Maps team at Google. Um, I'm on the Chrome Developer Relations team. Uh, then we have Jérôme Etienne, who is uh, currently somewhere else. <laughs> uh, he was hiding. OK. Um, Mikael Emtinger, uh, do you want to do an introduction, actually? Yeah, sure. Uh, I was part of the team that worked on Rome, uh, for example. And I'm a freelance, and I do some WebGL development. Uh, I'm also doing this little open source project called Glow, which is like a uh, WebGL wrapper, if you like to just play with shaders really quickly. Um, yeah. I'm doing, hopefully, I'm starting a, a big WebGL project next Tuesday, which is oh. due to be out in end of April, I think. So, okay. fingers crossed. Awesome. Um, then we have Paul Lewis uh, from aerotwist.com and Ricardo Cabello of 3JS fame and also from Rome. Rome. Yeah. So the topic today is WebGL, 3JS, the meaning of life, which we haven't gotten around to yet, but that is fixable. Actually, I have a question. Uh, what kind of a content pipeline do you guys use? Like if you have a, a model in Maya or some other 3D software and you want to do it on the web page, you want to put it on the web page, how do you do that? Are there any easy solutions? Can I say? I think uh, Bartek, whatever his last name is, uh, he did a little Unity, Unity exporter, which I really like, and I use a lot because then you you go through that. Um, you know, we can import any kind of from any like 3D package, which is nice. And what is really nice is what I've used a lot is uh, that you can, you know, do small C sharp uh, plugins to tag objects and do your own materials and whatnot and customize your exporter really easy. So I'm really a big fan of that that part that that pipeline basically. Yeah, um, I'll I'll second that. Um, I've actually been working on a, a set of Unity exporters and whatnot, uh, a lot of it based on what Bartek was doing. Um, I did find uh, there was, I, I was slightly frustrated in that Unity doesn't actually expose APIs for querying things like visibility information or whatnot. So if you want to use it to expose, you know, full, um, like, game appropriate levels, uh, it's going to take a little bit more work on, on your part, but it does definitely give you uh, very good um, low-level access to your basic meshes, animations, materials, anything like that. And so as a general asset um, exporter, it works really well. As, as a proper, like as a, a full uh, open source nerd, I will say Blender. <laughs> 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 You can, you can Why do we all laugh when he says Blender? I mean, come on, it's a cool. Some people are terrible. Don't laugh. <laughs> Me and Ricardo have had this discussion hundred times. I think. <laughs> and I won't. A Blender is very good. Blender is very good too, of course. Uh, yeah, you can you can just write any all, all these processes in Python, and you have like you, you actually have access to a lot of stuff. And we don't even like we have it. We have it for exporting stuff directly from from Blender to 3.js JSON format. And um, we we still have to do it, the animation and everything. And you know we have mainly static and scene stuff. But uh, it, to me, it seems I don't know. It you get to you you need to get used to to Blender. But uh, 
But once you get that done, it's really easy. For me, it works like pretty well as a pipeline. Yes, and, and, and it was the pipeline we used <laughs> in Rome, and, and it worked pretty well. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I had some, I did some like Blender scripting. And the nice thing about that is that it's actually pretty simple to get started and to just export your objects and data from Blender in uh, whatever format you want on the, in, in your WebGL application. So that was great. And we also get bones, which are sometimes a little fiddly to work with, but it's definitely doable. And it's free. It's free. Mm -hmm. What are some of the uh, some of your your favorite WebGL sites and demos that you guys have seen? Uh, GLSL.heroku.org or .com. The, uh, Ricardo, your little <laughs> shader toy. But I love good that. Work, good work. I love it so much. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting. It's like there's there's also uh, a lot of uh, uh, graphics developers that they don't like JavaScript at all. So that website is just like a, something that they can put their brain out and share all the all what they know without having to care about the you know JavaScript. And there's a really crazy stuff on there. I don't even understand like half of, of what the people are doing. Maybe a good time to show some now. Can you show some some crazy? I know. Let me see. So you can def you can try screen sharing if you'd like, and we can see if that uh, if that's that will work. Uh, trying it. Oh yeah. Don't break it. Is it working? Uh, yes. Yes. Pete might need to like select yep. your screen. Yeah, I've got I've got it forced on you, so you're up on screen. Um, let's see about this one. Well, I mean, I, I I don't check it too often, but so this guy, I mean, basically this website, um, you code what we are seeing, just this effect that we are seeing here, uh, it's done uh, with this code. There is no textures or anything being loaded. It's just uh, some code that generates textures dynamically and even the camera path and everything. And so you can you can get stuff like from this landscape which, again, I have no idea how to start to do this. Um, let's see. Ricardo, how large is the code for those mountains? Can, can you say that again? How many lines for the mountains? How many oh, let lines? me see. Uh, let me see. Because I think that's a key point, I mean. Sure, sure. 253. Yeah, pretty good for what we see on the screen, I would say. Yeah. And there's like so many random things, like this guy wanted to have a lot of effects um, at the same time. Um, I don't know if it's maybe it's a little bit too small for the sharing. Let me see if I find another one. Um, the good thing, the good thing with this website is that uh, anyone, oh, this one doesn't work. Anyone is able to fork uh, uh, a really working effect. So people will, someone will make like a sphere or like a, some simple ray tracing effect, and then someone else, like there is, you don't even know who they are. Like they will come and they will improve it. And you know, there is a lot of knowledge sharing uh, from there. That it's, I think, I find it really interesting. Um, I don't know, like really crazy things, like fractal stuff. I remember seeing that some guy actually implemented a snake game using a yeah. plan. Um, there was this this challenge that because there is a, one of the, the, the two two layers of data you can save some states of the game as color pixels on this second layer that you don't see. So they, some people started to try to create games uh, using that technique. 
uh, but I it may be a little bit. The website is a little bit hard to you, navigate. You need uh, a search function. Yeah, and tagging, I guess, and comments, and you know, <laughs> uh, some maybe someday will come. Um, there it was. Which one? Uh, snake. It says it in the bottom corner of the screen right now. Um, <coughs> maybe it was in the previous one. Hmm. I don't know. Actually, I'm not finding it. Yeah, it, it should be mentioned, I guess, for anybody who's um, watching this and not entirely familiar with, with the WebGL concepts. Everything on this particular site is more or less done entirely in shader code. Um, so that that is somewhat limiting to what can be done, although obviously you've got a lot of people here who are more than happy to prove that wrong. Um, but it it's not something that's going to give you access to the full range of WebGL capabilities, but it does provide a fascinating look into what can be done just with that um, GLSL language. So, so uh, oh, I don't know if it's working at all. So, so basically, to make it a little bit simpler to understand, what we're seeing here is just two polygons on this screen, like like one one polygon, one triangle that goes on the top left, and one polygon, one triangle that goes on the bottom left, and the rest is just done with this uh, framing shader, which basically is this code that is going to be executed for every pixel that we hit, that we see on the screen, and we have the position of, you know, we have the uh, this. I don't know where you can see any of that, but we have from the code we have the position where the pixel is, so we can start from there. We can start to say have some mathematical functions that will create some shapes or some uh, whatever. It's up to you what you can do uh, from just with that information. Um, Only yeah. 80 lines, just saying. For the game, cool. yeah. Cool. Well, we're uh, almost uh, at our, our time. Um, I want to just sort of open it up to all of our, our guests and say, is there anything you guys want to add sort of as we get ready to wrap things up today? I wanted to add that uh, there, there. I know at least a few of us are are on Stack Overflow, and we watch the WebGL tag closely. So if you have any questions about WebGL, definitely get on there. Uh, make sure it's a technical question. It's not like you know, what should I do? Uh, with you know, and that's it. Um, yeah. You know, it should actually be a specific question, something that you're facing. Um, if but, you but have an urge, on there, and there's people that will answer. Yeah, if you have an urge to go on Stack Overflow and ask what's the best WebGL framework, please don't. <laughs> That's been asked many, many times. But we're more than happy to help with you know, um, technical questions, optimization questions, whatever the case may be. This is broken. Why is it broken? Yeah, we're yeah. definitely happy to help. Yeah, that question comes up quite a lot, right? When yeah, you're working with WebGL. This is broken. Why is it broken? I've just got a black screen. <laughs> exactly. Do you have a light in the scene? <laughs> <laughs> is the camera facing the right way? The matrix is wrong. <laughs> matrix. Cool. All right, guys. Well, we're at our time. I want to say thanks to everybody for joining us today. Uh, I hope you all found it really useful. Please add the Chrome Developers uh, Plus page to your uh, circles if you haven't done that already, and or plus one us. Uh, thanks to all our attendees and speakers, and for everybody for watching. Bye, guys. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.